Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those that celebrate, I hope you've had a great Christmas day, afternoon, or evening. If you'd like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing or you've been here the entire time and haven't done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share and comment not only does it help the channel out but it also reminds you of every time i upload a video with all of that being said it is time to go back to ashes for once we arise from the ashes we are a bigger brighter stronger and a happier person in the morning sit back relax kick back grab a snack or tuck in and get warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled true unsolved mysteries volume 18. right after this intro and ad will play i'll read the first case in ad will play and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. West Mesa Bone Collector, Albuquerque's Baffling Murder Case. Archaeological Twist to Homicides. In a bone-chilling tale that rocked Albuquerque, New Mexico, a series of heinous homicides came to light with a harrowing archaeological twist in February of 2009. It all began when a woman was out on a routine stroll with her dog in the desolate West Mesa area. The dog stumbled upon a bone that would give birth to the story of the West Mesa bone collector, who created the largest crime scene in New Mexico's history. Little did the woman know that her dog's gruesome find would unravel the unimaginable. A haunting burial ground where the remains of 11 females aged between 15 and 32 lay concealed in shallow graves. Bone Chilling Puzzle The remains were found in various stages of decomposition, making it challenging to determine the exact cause of death for each victim. It took authorities over a year to identify all the victims, using dental records, personal items found at the burial site, and collaboration with family members. Most of the women are believed to have died from asphyxiation or drug overdose. The investigation revealed that some of the victims, all female and mostly Hispanic, may have been involved in sex work. DNA Degradation by the time their bodies were discovered, the 11 victims had been buried in the desert for several years. Due to the passage of time and the harsh environmental conditions, DNA degradation is a considerable obstacle. Exposure to heat, moisture, and microbial activity can cause DNA to break down, making it challenging to obtain viable samples for analysis. When bodies are not adequately preserved or protected, the potential contamination of any remains further complicates the retrieval of usable DNA. As a result, the usefulness of DNA analysis in identifying potential suspects was significantly diminished. Too close for comfort. When a case like this unfolds close to home, the impact leaves an indelible mark on the community. We live in Albuquerque, about 10 to 12 miles away from the site where the women were buried. Although we did not live in New Mexico when it happened, the weight of the situation feels overwhelming. Such heinous acts in our city creates a chilling sense of vulnerability and unease, especially since the case remained unsolved. The Victims the following is a list of the victims listed chronologically by the date that they were reported missing or last seen. Monica Candelaria, May 2003. Veronica Romero, February 2004. Evelyn Salazar and Jamie Barella, April 2004. Selenia Edwards, May 2004. Cinnamon Elks, August 2004. Julie Nito, August 2004. Virginia Cloven, October 2004. Doreen Marquez, December 2004. Michelle Valdez, February 2005. Victoria Chavez, March 2005. Visiting the Memorial Site 
Experiencing the haunting reality of these murders firsthand, rather than just hearing and reading about them, stirred a deep emotion within me. An indescribable feeling compelled Mike and me to embark on a journey across town. We resolved to witness this with our own eyes where the women had been buried, as the exact location of their murders remains a mystery to this day. It was a necessary step for us to comprehend the significance and depth of their tragic fate. As we venture through the solemn grounds of the memorial site, a profound sense of gravity enveloped me. Each tribute site, representing the precious lives lost, held a poignant significance. We paused at every plaque, paying homage to the women, each with their own story cut short. Several women left behind young children. These 11 souls denied the opportunity to grow old, would never experience the blessings of grandchildren or the wonders life has to offer. Regardless of their chosen profession, many broken-hearted people mourned and continue to mourn their deaths. No arrests have been made. Several suspects have been identified over the years, but to date, no arrests have been made and no one has been charged in connection with the murders. Some theories surrounding the West Mesa murders suggest the involvement of a serial killer, while others point toward the possibility of a sex trafficking ring. However, no conclusive evidence has been found to support these claims. Suspect Joseph Blee Believing all the women had been murdered by a single perpetrator, Investigators focused on two men as suspects, one of whom was Joseph Blee. Blee emerged as a person of interest during the extensive investigation. Born in 1953, Blee was a notorious figure in the Albuquerque community at the time. His connection to the case stemmed from his criminal past. He had previously been convicted and in prison for sexually assaulting and attacking women. Given the nature of the unsolved murders and the possible involvement of a serial killer, authorities took a closer look at him as a potential suspect. During the investigation, certain factors seemed to align with Blee's profile, raising suspicions among law enforcement. Backed by his record and proximity to the West Mesa area, he became intensely scrutinized. Blee had consistently maintained his innocence concerning the West Mesa murders. In 2015, Blee was sentenced to 36 years in prison for sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl. He is suspected of sexually assaulting dozens of young girls decades ago. He remains in prison. Suspect Lorenzo Montoya Lorenzo Montoya is a name forever intertwined with the chilling unsolved case of the West Mesa Bone Collector. An intriguing web of evidence and circumstances seems to point towards his involvement in these heinous crimes. However, Montoya murdered a woman and was carrying her body out when he was killed by the woman's pimp, so the truth died with him. Every investigation thrives on piecing together a puzzle and the fragments connecting Montoya to the West Mesa Bone Collector are no exception. Though no definitive proof has been found, a careful examination of available information uncovers compelling threads that reinforce the possibility of his guilt. In my mind, there's not just the possibility, as I believe Montoya was, indeed, the murderer. Montoya's proximity to the scene of the crimes cannot be overlooked. At the time, his residence was disturbingly close to the infamous burial ground. Such close physical proximity raised eyebrows and fueled suspicions about his potential involvement. Montoya's troubled past served as an unsettling backdrop. His history of violence, including assaulting a prostitute, hints at a predisposition towards aggressive behavior that likely escalated into the horrific crimes attributed to the bone collector. While this alone does not confirm his guilt, 
that adds to the emerging profile of a potentially dangerous individual. Additionally, his sudden death before any substantial investigation into his connections to the case compounds the mystery surrounding Montoya. I can't help but think that his demise robbed us of the opportunity to uncover the whole story. Conclusive evidence is still lacking, and my opinions are my own. However, the constellation of circumstances surrounding Lorenzo Montoya paints a compelling picture that leads many to believe he was the infamous West Mesa phone collector. Whenever I read stories that reveal that the case has not been solved and that the killer still walks amongst us, I tend to roll my eyes in disagreement. The Paraquat Murders, Japan's Vending Machine Serial Killer Japanese Vending Machine Murders When you think of vending machines, you probably think of salty, high-carb snacks, sugary drinks, and maybe the dopamine rush that comes with watching your purchase drop in the dispenser tray beneath. What you probably don't associate them with is danger, murders, and psychopaths. But, in the 1980s, Japan, vending machines became the unusual weapon of choice for an unknown assailant hell-bent on causing as much suffering and death as possible. The result of their actions led to the demise of no less than a dozen people and ruined the lives of many more. The handiwork of what may be Japan's most notorious yet mysterious serial killers. The First Victim on April 30, 1985, in Fukuyama, Hiroshima Prefecture, a 45-year-old truck driver was admitted to a hospital with what appeared to be a rapidly progressing illness. His symptoms included nausea, abdominal pain, muscle weakness, confusion, seizures, and respiratory failure, all of which were progressing at an uncontrollable and worrying rate. By his second day in hospital, the victim had developed scarring on his lungs and his kidney and liver were beginning to fail. By May 2nd, just three days after his symptoms first appeared, the man tragically passed away. Doctors noted that his illness was symptomatic with poisoning. After testing samples of his vomit, they found high amounts of the toxic herbicide Paraquat, suggesting someone had poisoned him. Before his death, the truck driver mentioned to doctors that he had been to a vending machine on his way to work, where he had obtained two bottles of the health drink, Uranamin C. What's particularly important to note here, though, is that he had only technically purchased one drink. At the time of the truck driver's poisoning, vending machine companies across Japan were running a special promotion whereby if you bought certain drinks, there was a chance that a second may fall into the tray. Only one drink fell for him on this occasion, but he noticed someone had left a second drink on top of the vending machine. Assuming that someone else had won the special promotion and didn't want the second drink, he decided to take it. As it turned out, this proved to be his fatal undoing. As further investigation found Paraquat inside the bottle, it's important to note that, outside of big cities like Tokyo, people in Japan are traditionally pretty trusting regarding food and beverages due to low crime rates and cultural traditions. To this day, it's not uncommon to find unmanned grocery stores in rural Japan where people are trusted not to tamper with food and leave money behind for their purchases. Gift giving is also a very common practice as a result, the idea that someone might leave a second drink behind for a stranger and the assumption that such a drink is safe to consume, it is not as odd as it might sound to people from other cultures. What is Paraquat and why is it so dangerous? Paraquat is an herbicide used to remove unwanted weeds and other plants. Unfortunately, it's also extremely toxic to humans and even a small amount can cause severe harm. 
Ingesting Paraquat can cause a multitude of symptoms, including liver and kidney failure. But the most severe effects occur in the lungs due to the fibrosis-like symptoms Paraquat causes. Further, Poisonings Doctors and investigators alike were left clueless as to why someone would put Paraquat in a random bottled beverage and leave it for a random passerby. The nature of the poisoning also effectively ruled out the possibility of a targeted attack on the truck driver. Without any leads, all they could do was hope that this was a one-off incident. For a while, it looked like it might be the case, but several months later, history repeated itself. In September of the same year, over 150 miles away, a second person suffered Paraquat poisoning under similar circumstances. On this occasion, the victim was a 52-year-old man, Haru Atsu, who had stopped by a vending machine to pick up a bottle of Oronaman C, only to find two bottles in the dispenser tray. Like the previous victim, the man thought it was his lucky day, but after starting to drink one of those bottles on the way home, he began to feel ill. Realizing that the drink might be to blame, Atsu checked into the nearest hospital and brought the bottle with him. Tests revealed that the beverage was indeed laced with Paraquat, but sadly, there was little doctors could do to help Atsu, and two days later, he passed away. Almost simultaneously, another similar incident, this time involving a student, occurred over 100 miles away in the city of Matusaka. Again, a paraquat lace beverage was to blame. The authorities respond. Pretty soon, it became clear to authorities that these incidents were related and suspicions grew that a serial killer was behind it all. Unfortunately, in 1985, Japan, surveillance cameras were not common and DNA testing was still unreliable. And even as the number of poisonings and the death toll grew, investigators were left with no leads, no established motive, and nowhere to turn. In response, the Japanese government asked vending machine companies to increase their security and for the public to be more wary. Meanwhile, police distributed leaflets warning people to check bottle caps and vending machines for tampering before consuming products. Signs were put up on the vending machines themselves, yet over the next couple of months, cases of poisoning began to climb. Interestingly, the poisonings never happened in the same city twice and spanned the entire country, from Mayakanjo in the southwest to Miyagi in the northeast, suggesting the murder or murderers were traveling from city to city to carry out the killings. Between September and November alone, 25 people fell victim to Paraquat poisoning after drinking vending machine beverages, and another 10 people died leading to a final death toll of 12 people. A 17-year-old girl from Saitama, the only female to die from the poisonings, is believed to have been the last victim, passing away after drinking a cola laced with Paraquat. And with that, the poisoning suddenly stopped. Who was the Paraquat poisoner? We might assume that just one psychotic individual was behind these killings and Japanese police suspect this is the case. However, there's no way of confirming this to be true. Indeed, it could have been a group of people or a series of copycat killers behind the poisonings. We do know that there is at least one case of a copycat killer who put lime sulfur in drinks in Tokyo. Someone else left tainted cartons of milk inside a cereal Japanese school around the same time. Some thought the murders might be linked to the attempted extortion of food companies by a group calling itself the Mystery Man with 21 Faces, who had been active during much of 1984. This group has been known to poison food stocks, including lacing candy with cyanide. However, unlike the Paraquat killer, the group was notably blasé and boastful about what they were doing and were always sure to place warning labels over items. 
Their motive had been to scare companies into paying ransoms, not killing people. The Paraquat killer, on the other hand, seemed to have the opposite motive, leaving no threats, no warning, and demanding no money. As things stand, it's unlikely that we'll ever know who committed these crimes or whether the criminal behind them is still at large. For that matter, we'll likely never know why they did what they did either. Why did the vending machine murderer commit their crimes? Again, no one knows for sure what the motive behind these killings were, but several experts have since weighed in on their opinions. Analyzing the case, Hiroki Iwao, a Tokyo professor for criminal sociology, suggested that the murders may have been a kind of stress relief for the killer from Japan's high-intensity, work-oriented culture, saying that it is not uncommon for Japanese who live under tremendous pressure, both on the job and in overcrowded communities, to let out their frustrations by hurting someone else. Meanwhile, Susumu Oda, a mental health specialist at the University of Tsukuba, believes the criminal poisoned people because it gave them a sense of superiority, telling the New York Times that they cynically enjoy superiority by imagining the victims groaning and do not feel any remorse. Why did the murder stop? After November 25, 1985, no further cases of Paraquat poisoning involving vending machine beverages occurred. But why is that? Some believe that the killer was simply satisfied with the devastation they had caused. Others think they may have decided to quit while they were ahead. It's also possible that something happened to them in November that prevented them from continuing their actions. It's almost possible that the killer believed their window of opportunity to commit these crimes was over. After all, most vending machines now featured warnings, and members of the public were now wary of the dangers of tampered drinks. Furthermore, the makers of Oranaman C, the beverage the killer tended to target, announced to the public that they were making their bottles tamper-proof. As a result, it would have been increasingly difficult for the assailant to pull off his poisonings. Whether they went on to commit other crimes or not is also a complete mystery. Similarities to Other Cases Many have drawn comparisons between the Paraquat poisoning and a similar poisoning scare in the United States, known as the Tylenol murders, which saw an unknown Chicago assailant laced painkiller tablets with cyanide. As with the Paraquat poisonings, the culprit behind the Tylenol murders was never identified, and it's possible the Paraquat poisoner was inspired by these murders. The Paraquat murders are not the only example of a serial killer using Paraquat to kill their victims. For instance, between 2011 and 2013, a South Korean woman known as Korea's Black Widow used Paraquat to murder several family members, including two ex-husbands. The Brutal Murder of the Walker Family A Horrific Act On December 19, 1959, Cliff and Christine Walker and their two children, Jimmy and Debbie, were brutally murdered in their home. Over the course of the ultimately fruitless investigation, countless suspects and leads would be considered, including a possible connection to the infamous murder of the Clutter family the subject of Truman Capote's acclaimed 1966 true crime book in cold blood, which had occurred just a month earlier. But were Perry Smith and Richard Hickok truly responsible for this crime? Or was it someone else who targeted the unsuspecting and well-liked Walkers? The Walkers Clifford, or Cliff Walker, born October 16, 1934, and Evelyn Christine Myers, born November 18, 1935, who went by either her middle name or Tilly, began dating in high school. The couple would marry in 1955. 
Their son, James, was born on August 24, 1956. Less than a year and a half later, on January the 11th of 1958, Christine gave birth to the couple's second child, a daughter named Deborah. The small family resided in rural Osprey, Florida, in a house located on the ranch where Cliff was employed. The outgoing Christine and the hardworking Cliff seemed to live a simple but happy life with their children. In December 1959, Cliff, who earned $55 a week managing a herd of cattle on Palmer Ranch, wanted to trade in Christine's 1952 Plymouth for a newer vehicle. The day before they died, they visited various used car lots, trying to find something suitable. However, they decided that they have to keep looking. That same day, Christine informed her mother and mother-in-law that Cliff had been in a fight with someone and liked to get killed someday. The exact details and circumstances surrounding this altercation, as well as the identity of the person with whom Cliff came to blows, are unknown. Day of the Murders On the afternoon of December 19, 1959, Cliff was visiting his friend and fellow ranch hand, Don McLeod, who also resided on the 100,000-acre Palmer Ranch. Christine showed up with the children in tow to see her husband at around 3.45 p.m. When she departed a short time later, the exact time is unclear, she left Jimmy and Debbie with Cliff, who had his work vehicle with him because they wanted to ride in the Jeep with Daddy. Approximately 15 to 20 minutes later, Cliff and the children headed home as well. This was the final time the walkers were seen alive. Don and Cliff had made plans to go hog hunting the following morning. When he showed up at the Walker family home on December 20th, he was surprised to find it dark and uncharacteristically quiet. He knocked multiple times but received no response. After several minutes of waiting, Don was starting to get a bad feeling. Depending on the account, he either cut through the screen of the front door or tripped the lock with a penknife to gain entrance to the home. Don was unprepared for the grisly scene he was about to witness. The lifeless and bloody body of Christine Walker was lying on the floor in the living room doorway. She had been sexually assaulted and beaten before her assailant shot her in the head. In another part of the room were the bodies of Cliff and three-year-old Jimmy lying next to each other. Both had suffered a gunshot wound to the head as well. Debbie, less than a month shy of her second birthday, was found dead in the bathtub. She had been shot and drowned. Horrified, Don contacted the police immediately. The investigation was about to begin in earnest. The investigation. The authorities combed over the entire house and property, but the only clues left behind by the killer were a bloody boot print, spent cartridges from a 22 caliber weapon, a cellophane strip from the wrapper of a cool cigarette, and a fingerprint on the bathtub's faucet handle. Law enforcement also discovered what appeared to be semen on Christine's body. It looked as if she had fought her attacker. A bloody suede pump was on the floor near her body, which the police assumed she had used as a weapon. Several items were missing from the Walker home as well, including Cliff's pocket knife, Christine's high school majorette uniform, and the couple's marriage certificate. Additionally, her car wasn't parked in its usual spot, leading detectives to speculate that the killer may have moved it for some reason. The family's three hunting dogs were still out front, unharmed, and investigators wondered how the killer had managed to get past them. This, coupled with the personal nature of the stolen item, initially led them to think that the murderer likely knew the walkers and was fixated on Christine. Don McLeod was questioned and given a polygraph exam, which he passed. Sarasota Sheriff Ross Boyer said that McLeod was definitely cleared early on in the investigation. 
every time man is being used night and day and we're checking out any and all leads, continued Boyer. Months later, three women discovered bloody clothing, a skirt, a blouse, pants, and a handkerchief in a shed near the walker's home. It was confirmed that these items belonged to Christine and Cliff, and it was believed that the killer, or killers, had used the articles to wipe the blood off themselves before discarding them there. Suspect, Wilbur Tucker. Wilbur Tucker, a neighbor of the Walkers, was one of the first individuals to be identified as a person of interest in this case. Tucker, a 65-year-old retired railroad telegrapher, had worn out his welcome at the Walker home after repeatedly sexually harassing Christine. When Cliff found out about Tucker's inappropriate behavior towards his wife, he had very much wanted to hurt the older man, but Christine talked him out of it, and the couple instead banished Tucker from ever visiting them again. He could account for his whereabouts for part of the afternoon, as well as for that evening. He'd played his violin at a concert in Brandonton. However, he had no verifiable alibi for four to five on the day in question. While Tucker was seen in the area that afternoon, perhaps not that odd considering that he lived there, he was photographed without any marks on him the day after the murders, creating doubt that he could have been the assailant. Wilbur Tucker had a heart attack and passed away in 1963. If he knew anything about the Walker case, he took that information to the grave with him. Suspect Curtis McCall a local man named Harland McCall came forward to say that his cousin Curtis, a former boyfriend of Christine's, was the man responsible for killing the Walker family. According to him, Curtis and Christine had continued to have an affair even after her marriage to Cliff. He said that Christine had shown up at his mother's house just two weeks before she died looking for Curtis. Cliff was away participating in a rodeo at the time. Harlan also stated that Curtis owned a 22 caliber pistol and had been on the edge ever since the news had come about the grisly crime. Additionally, he had a history of violence and attacked a man in the past. When questioned, Curtis told investigators that he had in fact owned a 22 caliber weapon at one point, but had sold it some time ago and couldn't remember the name of the buyer. His polygraph test produced inconclusive results and suggested, if nothing else, that he was withholding information. Though, as later experts would point out, polygraph examinations from that era were essentially worthless. Curtis not only vehemently denied an involvement in the murders, but also denied ever having even dated Christine. With no solid evidence tying him to the crime, it appears that law enforcement didn't pursue this avenue of investigation any further, and Curtis's later whereabouts are unknown. Suspect, Elbert Walker. Cliff's cousin, Elbert Walker, aroused suspicion after a dramatic display of grief at the Walker's funeral, including fainting twice. His family believed that he was faking it, that he himself was actually responsible for the heinous act. Elbert, whom they claimed was in love with Christine, was known to be wild and belligerent when drinking. His girlfriend stated that when he told her about how the family had died, he made the heartbreaking assertion that little Jimmy had crawled over to his father before dying. How he would know this is unclear, as the police report only said that the child was found huddled next to his father and made no more remarks on the position of his body or if there was a trail of his blood leading to Cliff. Elbert was shocked that his family had implicated him and denied committing the murders, explaining that the extreme difficulty he experienced in coming to terms with the loss was largely due to his close relationship with Cliff. He passed two different polygraph exams, including one that was administered to him decades later, in the 1980s, using the updated technology of the day. 
according to Detective Dario Valente. Elbert is not responsible for the Walker murders. Elbert Walker was extremely cooperative and appreciated the active concern regarding this case's investigation. Perry Smith and Richard Hickok Perry Smith and Richard Hickok, the killers made famous by Truman, Capote's true crime novel, in Gold Blood, were two recently paroled ex-convicts in 1959. While incarcerated, Hickok's cellmate told him a story about a successful farmer from whom he'd worked, named Herb Clutter. He claimed that Herb kept a large amount of money in a safe inside the Holcomb, Kansas home where he resided with his wife Bonnie and their teenage children, Kenyon and Nancy. Following his release from prison, Hickok contacted Smith, and the two began to conspire about robbing the Clutter home and starting a new life with the money they'd find. This would be a stench, the perfect score, said Hickok. On the night of November 14, 1959, Smith and Hickok entered the Clutter residence through an unlocked door and began what would ultimately prove to be a fruitless search for the safe. They tied up each of the four clutters and resumed their quest to locate the cash. When they realized that there was no fortune to be found there, as it turned out, Herb conducted all of his business transactions by check and did not own a safe. They murdered the frightened family. Herb's throat was cut and all four had suffered a single gun blast to the head. Before leaving, Smith and Hickok took Kenyon's Zenith portable radio, Herb's binoculars, and less than $50 in cash. The two stole a vehicle and fled to Florida. Their stolen car was spotted around a dozen times between Tallahassee and Miami in the days leading up to the murder of the Walker family. Additionally, witnesses reported seeing men who resembled Smith and Hickok in a department store in Sarasota approximately 10 miles away from the Walker residence. After the killings, one of them was said to have scratches on his face. The stolen vehicle they were driving was also supposedly the same make and model as the one that Cliff was looking to purchase for his wife. Investigators have theorized that this may have been how they initially made contact with the family, if they in fact did. Truman Capote who devoted several pages to the Walker case in his book, claimed that Smith and Hickok had solid alibis and could not have been responsible. However, eyewitness accounts and records contradict this assertion. On December 30, 1959, Perry Smith and Richard Hickok were arrested in Las Vegas and charged for the murder of the Clutter family. They had with them a pocket knife, similar to the one stolen from Cliff, a toddler shirt, and a pink jacket. None of these items were ever confirmed to belong to the Walkers, however. While the two men would admit to their guilt in a clutter case, neither would claim responsibility for the Walker slayings. Also, the fingerprint found on the faucet of the Walker bathroom was not a match to either man. Despite this, they were considered strong suspects in the case as early as 1960. Smith and Hickok were ultimately convicted of murdering the Clutters and executed by hanging on April 14, 1965. Later Developments Over the decades, several police agencies would either misplace or destroy evidence in the Walker case. The FBI purged the palm prints of Smith and Hickok an especially unfortunate loss given that it was later determined that the fingerprint on the faucet had actually been a partial palm print. The challenges of a case from that long ago, you're bound by what was done in 1959, said Captain Joe Gaiasone, a veteran of the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office. The bodies of Perry Smith and Richard Hickok were exhumed in 2013 to extract DNA for comparison against the semen found on the crime scene. The results were inconclusive. Neither were deemed a match, but only partial DNA could be retrieved. Dr. Michael Baird, lab director of the DNA Diagnostic Center in Ohio, 
spoke of the difficulty of working with a partial DNA profile. Quote, the ability to make a match with an individual would be compromised. It's not uncommon for this to happen with a sample at all, end quote. Another blow of the investigation came when it was discovered that the semen found on Christine, a crucial piece of evidence that had been used to compare against and rule out suspects for years, was not semen at all. It was skin and or blood cells from Christine herself. However, a stain containing a single sperm cell was found on Christine Walker. When analyzed in 2019, it generated pieces of DNA from two different people, one male and one female. Unfortunately, it was too tangled for experts to isolate the individuals. Pat Myers, the younger brother of Christine Walker, has never given up on finding his sister's killer. All told, 587 suspects have been considered at one time or another. While many considered Richard Hickok and Perry Smith to be the most plausible suspects, there are those who believe the killer was far more likely to have been someone who knew the family personally. Sadly, the lack of good DNA evidence to test makes a definitive solution even more unlikely. And so, the case of the Walkers, the young family who was brutally murdered less than a week before Christmas, remains open and unsolved. Suzanne Morphew, Colorado woman missing since 2020, remains found. What happened to Suzanne? Suzanne Morphew, 49, went missing on Mother's Day of 2020 after going for a bike ride in Shafi County, Colorado. Her bicycle was found near Suzanne's house the day she went missing. The bike had been thrown down a ravine along Country Road 225 in Shafi County. Her bike helmet was found five days later off Route 50 near her house. An exhaustive search ensued. Canines, helicopters, volunteers, and family looked for her, but found nothing. On September 22, 2023, authorities located the missing mother's remains while searching Moffat, about 45 minutes south of her home in Maysville. Colorado Bureau of Investigation agents were searching the area in an unrelated matter and came upon Suzanne's body, only adding to the mystery. Investigators have refused to release the location where Suzanne was found but multiple reports indicate that her remains were found in a shallow grave in a remote desert. Her bones were dispersed in the area due to animal activity and elements. In 2020, prosecutors initially charged her husband, Barry Morphew, with murder, then dropped the case. Shafi County Sheriff John Spez says he has more questions than answers, but will continue to pursue the case. Quote, we have never stopped our investigation and will continue to follow all leads in pursuit of justice for Suzanne. He told the Associate Press he has declined to be interviewed or hold a press conference yet. Arrest Affidavit in the arrest affidavit, Barry said his wife planned to leave him, but later changed his story as authorities developed evidence. Suzanne's bike was found the day she disappeared, thrown down a ravine along Country Road 225 in Shafi County. Barry, an avid hunter, did not tell investigators that he had driven out of his way as he left for work on Mother's Day and drove his car near where his wife's helmet was found five days after she vanished. Barry would later tell investigators that he drove that way because he had seen an elk cross the road. Barry pleaded not guilty. In a surprise turn of events, the charges were dropped by prosecutors when the judge barred them from calling critical witnesses because of a failure to follow the rules for turning over evidence in Barry's favor. Included was DNA from an unknown male connected to sexual assault cases 
in several other states and found inside Suzanne's SUV. This raised the potential that another suspect could be involved. Barry filed a $15 million lawsuit against county officials for violating his civil rights. The charges were dismissed without prejudice in April 2022, just days before he was to stand trial. Still, they left the door open for prosecutors to charge him later should additional evidence be uncovered. Standing Strong In May 2022, Barry and Suzanne's daughters appeared on Good Morning America with her father. Barry told ABC News in an exclusive interview that it was hurtful to lose his reputation and have his integrity damaged. Mallory and Macy said that the last three years have been literally our worst nightmare. But they stand firmly behind their father. They say they have never doubted that he is innocent and saw nothing amiss in the days preceding their mother's disappearance. However, text messages obtained by prosecutors appeared to reflect a strained marriage. Suzanne referred to her husband as Jackal and Hyde and told him, I'm done, right, before she went missing. In a text message to one of Suzanne's friends, she wrote that she had a tough talk with her daughter Macy, who was aware of the tension in the relationship. She wrote that Macy almost begged her mother to divorce her father. Barry denies his marriage was in trouble, claiming they had a wonderful marriage and life together. Family Relieved According to a source at the Daily Mail, Barry says he is relieved and confident he will be cleared of all suspicion of involvement in his wife's murder. Belinda Mormon Balzer, Suzanne's older sister, told the Denver Gazette that they were notified Wednesday morning that Suzanne's remains had been located. Barry had been informed first. Colorado is a vast and rugged place, and we have prayed that God would put light on where she is. We have been praying, and here we are today, Melinda told the Gazette. Melinda went on to say this event is but a snippet. She believes more will come out, and that she plans to trust the process. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 18. Yes, I know it's a little short, but I'm saving up for the rest of the year. I'd like to thank the reform members of the channel. Inner Scare Wifey, Howler's Mom, Tina Mead, Seven, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves, and I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good day, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.